whether you are watching online or here with us in person, why don't you join us as we sing? Let your glory fill this place. We're alive. 
desire of our hearts, God, to know you more, to be closer to you, God, and we will pursue you as long as we live.
one of the things that God promises us is that um, if we call out to Him or draw near to Him, He'll draw near to us. He's just waiting for us to ask. He wants to do that, but He wants to be invited in. He never wants to intrude or overstep. And so just singing those words and meaning them or even listening to someone else or just writing them down, reading them on the screen, that's enough. That's all He needs for you to just mean it, for you to believe it. He sees where you are and He sees your life and He hears everything you are saying and everything you're not saying. And so He's just waiting for the moment where you ask Him to come in and be closer to you. And that's all we have to do is sing those words out. And that's so special that the God of the universe who's so big doesn't miss a thing that's happening in your life, in my life. And that's all we have to do is say, God, I want to be close to you. I want to be close to you. Will you come closer to me? And his answer is always yes. So God, we thank you for that. We thank you that you're a God who means what he says and who keeps his promises and never leaves us. And so we ask that today we could walk out of that place, walk out of this place when we log off online, knowing that and believing that in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you for singing with us today. You can go ahead and grab a seat. Well, like Kate said, thanks so much for singing with us today. My name is Brady. I'm your host. It's so great to have you here with us at Central. And if you're new with us, we're especially glad that you're here. And if you are new, really everything that we do at Central can be summed up into two purposes. Number one, we want to introduce people to faith. And number two, we want you to grow deep in that faith to become all that God created you to be. And we truly believe that no matter where you are on that journey, where you are on that spectrum, there's a place for you to belong here at Central. And that's why everything we do is about inviting people into a life that matters. And so if you are new with us, we'd love to connect with you. That's the best place and best way to get started. And in the seat back in front of you, you'll see a blue card. That is the place to get started with us. Fill out as much information as you feel comfortable. And then once we're done here in the auditorium, take that completed blue card to the big blue wall out in the lobby. Easy to remember, blue card, blue wall. And when you do that, we want to put a gift in your hands, just a small token of our appreciation for you being here today. Of course, if you're joining us online today, we're so glad to have you as well. Wherever you're joining us from, we want to encourage you to interact with your online pastor. And again, thanks for making Central part of your weekend. At this time, I want to invite the hosts forward as we give today. If you are new with us, don't feel any obligation to give whatsoever. You being here is gift enough for us. But if you did come prepared to give, there are a number of different ways that you can do that each of which is detailed on the screen. And as we give this morning, I've just got a couple of brief announcements for you. The first is that a week from today, next Sunday night, 6 p.m., that's October 28th, we're going to be having our next encounter experience. And encounter is really a time that we set aside to go deeper in our spiritual journey with Jesus, but also time to grow deeper in relationship with each other. And so if you've never been, we want to encourage you, set aside this time. Again, it's next Sunday night, 6 p.m., right here in the Central Auditorium for Encounter. Hope to see you there. And then secondly, we can see it all around us. The leaves are beginning to turn color. Temperatures are dropping, which can only mean one thing. It is time to begin planning for Christmas. And I know it's a bit early, but just yesterday, I watched with my three-year-old daughter, Lily, the newest trailer for the reimagination of the classic Christmas film, The Grinch. She's very excited to see it, but we're also very excited about all that's going to be happening at Central this year during the holidays for Christmas. We're going all out, like we always do, with six identical experiences, three on the 23rd, three on the 24th, both days happening at 3, 5, and 7 p.m. So we want to encourage you to put those on your calendar if you haven't already, but also look forward to inviting your friends and family to this so that you can join together in making some Christmas memories and pointing your eyes towards Jesus during that holiday season. And then the week after Christmas, that's Sunday, December 30th, we're not going to be having an in-person experience on that day. It's going to be online only on the 30th, so you can sleep in a little bit longer and enjoy church that morning from the comfort of your sofa or couch at home. Of course, all of that's happening in December. Let's get back to reality right here in October. You picked a great weekend to be at church because we're entering into week number three of our current message series, Created to Be. So take a look at the screen.
great day. Anyone have snow in their car this morning? Okay, good. Just frost, yeah. Uh, we are in an incredible series called Created to Be, and uh, I just have the opportunity and the privilege this morning to be able to share with you on our third week, and I'm just so excited. Again, every time I get this opportunity just to be able to share with you some life experiences, um, some things from the Word of God, and just believing that we can actually uh, learn something today. And so our message created to be is ultimately about you and I both understanding that there's a reason why we're, we were created. And uh, when I think about my body, there's a part of my body that wants to remind me that it exists probably about twice a month. It's my baby toe. Now, I know that in, in most days, I don't think about my baby toe, but every once in a while, it makes me know that it's there by getting in the way of my bedpost. Do you know, you know, you know what I'm feeling? Has, has anyone ever felt that? I mean, you're walking and all of a sudden, bang, oh, from the bottom of your toe all the way up your leg, all the way up your body to the top of your head. It is this immense pain. Every nerve in your body is screaming out, what are you doing? And I'm reminded that my baby toe is there. I'm reminded that even my baby toe was created for a purpose. Even though I don't think about it, even though I think it's maybe insignificant, it's there for a reason. And what inspires me about this series is that you and I sometimes are in the same category. We think that our lives are maybe insignificant, that it doesn't really matter. There's not really a plan and a purpose for me. But as we've been learning, there is. You were created to be something great, that God has an incredible plan and purpose for you. And over the last two weeks, Pastor Bill has done an amazing job uh, with week one where we, we talked about created to love. And this idea that we are to love unconditionally, just as God has loved us unconditionally. And even though love is maybe not reciprocated, it doesn't mean that we still don't love in return. Uh, last week, talking about resilience, created to be resilient. This incredible message about how you and I are called to run a race. But sometimes the cares of life burden us down and we are encouraged by those around us to throw off those things and continue to run with perseverance, the race that is marked out for us. And today I have the awesome privilege of talking to you about how we are created to have an open mind. An open mind. Now I know what you're thinking because you're probably thinking what I was thinking. Well, what does this mean, open mind? What, what are we talking about this morning? And ultimately, this is what we, we feel. Our culture and society says that if you are a follower of Jesus or if you believe in the ways of Jesus, you actually have a closed mind to certain things. But I am here today and I believe with all my heart that we can learn today that being a follower of Jesus is actually releases the ceiling and allows us to have the greatest possibilities of the greatest life possible. To be all that we were created to be, I believe, that having an open mind, not just to anything or to everything, but having an open mind to following the life of Jesus and asking ourselves the question, how did Jesus live his life? What did Jesus say about this? What did Jesus say about that? Releases the ceiling and actually allows you and I to grow the most, to have an open mind, to grow in what we believe is the answer, which is Jesus Christ. And so let me talk to you about a few things uh, that have um, changed my perspective. I've really been on a two-year journey when it comes to this topic. Uh, God has done some incredible things in my life, just our family situations. It has forced us to think about what does it mean to have an open mind. And uh, there's one thing called confirmation bias. Now, maybe some of you have heard about this. Maybe some of you have not. Well, confirmation bias is what your brain does anytime something's confirmed in your life that works. So maybe uh, you've grown up a certain way, maybe you've um, heard certain things, and so your mind will automatically, uh, ha has this grid and will place certain truths that you've come up with and that you've experienced to say, yep, that works, yep, that works, yep, that works. So that if you're presented with an article, and your neighbor is presented with the exact same article, you will think through that article based on what your confirmation bias is. And so if the article agrees with your, the way you've grown up, you're like, yep, this is a wonderful article. If it doesn't, you're like, this is horrible. I'm not listening to this. 
And this works a lot of times in when you're in an argument. Maybe, let's say, with your wife, for me as example. <laughs> Just saying randomly. Uh, so many times I've told my wife, Alicia, I said, Alicia, it is not my fault this is just the way I'm wired. This is how my brain is thinking. I want to agree with what you're saying, but I just physically can't. I can't. It doesn't work. <laughs> and when you think about that, it's because there's certain things that my wife does and certain things that I do, a few things, uh, that, that we both are like, oh, man, I know you're so passionate about that, but I just don't get it. My mind just does not understand what you're doing. I want to talk to you about something very serious this morning. It's called yogurt jello. Now you laugh, but it is no laughing matter. <laughs> yogurt jello has caused immense arguments between Alicia and I, and I'll tell you why. Yogurt jello is delicious. It's exactly what it is, yogurt and jello mixed together to make this concoction that's either hot pink or baby blue, and it tastes amazing. We're on the same page when it comes to that. Both Alicia and I think the same thing. It's amazing. It tastes really good. The challenge comes when you're supposed to eat yogurt jello. She thinks you're supposed to eat it with the main course. I know. So you have turkey, mashed potatoes, stuffing, and yogurt jello on the same plate. And it's been part of her family, it's been part of her tradition, and she's thinking, this is how you do it. And I'm thinking, this is not how you do it. And everybody in the world is with me right now. It is not how you do it. I have no problem eating yogurt jello after the meal with the cannolis and with the, the, the pumpkin pie and yogurt jello. Yeah, let's enjoy it together. Nope, it has to go with the main meal. It is something she grew up with. It is something that she will not bend. She says, no, this is how you eat it. Now, I say that, and yet in my own family, I grew up with a dad who, uh, who believes wholeheartedly that you can only eat certain pasta with certain types of vegetables. You cannot mix and match the different type of pastas. And we would have arguments growing up saying, Dad, just eat this. No, Johnny, you don't do that. No. <laughs> Dad, what? It's pasta. It tastes the same. No, it's not right. He grew up with this idea. I'm telling you, he, was, he is so passionate about his food. So passionate. You cannot mix this type of pasta with this type of vegetables. It's impossible. And I remember growing up, my mom, who was an incredible woman, just an incredible cook, would make pasta dishes and amazing. And once in a while, she would mix and try and explore and try and sneak it in. She would make a certain type of pasta with a certain type of vegetable. And my dad, at 40, 50 years old, would act like a five-year-old and say, no, I no eat. I'm thinking, what? Can I have it, dad? Thanks. <laughs> That's happened quite a bit growing up, if I don't know if you can tell. But um, <laughs> everyone laughs when I say that. I'm like, what are you? And it's, it's one of those things where his confirmation bias was clearly set. It did not matter. Well, when I first came uh, to this church eight years ago, uh, not even realizing it, but I had a certain bias when it came to running youth ministry. And so I came here eight years ago and from another church in Sarnia, and I ran youth ministry a certain way. And so I was here a couple of months, and I thought, you know what? It's time that we, we, we get out there and we do something awesome. And so I gathered a group of young people and young adults between 15 years old and about 20 years old. And I said, guys, I want your opinion. But before you give me your opinion, I want to tell you a series that I want to do that's going to revolutionize the Niagara region. We are going to get every single young person that's, that's between 12 years old and 18 years old, they are going to want to come to this series because it is that incredible. I was so passionate. I was excited. And I went on to explain this incredible idea. And they are so pumped about it. They're like, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And at the end of my explanation, I looked at them and I said, guys, this series is called The Matrix. And they look around and they say, what's The Matrix? I thought, what do you mean? You know, the movie, The Matrix. They're like, 
is it new? Like, when did it come out? I'm like, what? Guys, what are you talking about, is it new? They're like, well, when did it come out? I'm thinking, okay, about 20 years ago. <laughs> They're like, well, I'm 15. I wasn't even born yet. I'm like, oh, man. And my bias was so strong, I didn't even realize that I wasn't developing a series for 15-year-olds. I was developing a series for a 30-year-old, something that I loved. So we changed it. We just invited all the 30-year-olds. No, I'm just kidding. We said, you get a blue jelly bean or a red jelly bean. Which one you want? It's great. And uh, I'm sitting there not even realizing it, that I had this bias. And what it does is simple, simple. When, when you have a closed mind to new ideas, without even realizing it, it's this way you think, you close yourself off to new possibilities, to new ideas. Ultimately, God could be leading you in a certain way, and because of your bias, because of what you're so used to thinking, you're closed off even to the idea. And today I want to explore through real life scenarios, real life situations that affect us all through the word of God, through the life of Jesus, what does having an open mind actually do for you and I? How does it allow us to be all that we want to be and all that God has created us to truly be? Well, in real life scenarios, there's a few things that I want to talk through. How many of you remember Blockbuster Video? Blockbuster Video, now for those of you under 20 years old, we actually used to go to a store <laughs> with money in hand and rent DVDs or VHSs, if you were really the big, thick ones, and you would go to the store on a Friday and you would get movies and you can only keep them for a day, maybe two days if you're lucky. But if you don't bring them back on time, what happens? Late fees. <gasps> How many times do I, my heart starts racing? I forgot the DVD and I go home and grab it and bring it back. We would actually have to go and rent movies from a store. And in the 90s, Blockbuster had the market on this. They, they were, they were uh, doing what nobody else was doing. You would go to some other stores, but they weren't quite like the experience. You would walk in and they gave you free popcorn and the smell of popcorn and the new releases on the big Sony Trinitron 27-inch TV. And you're thinking, this is amazing. And you're walking around and you can rent video games and you can rent brand new movies and you think, wow, this is amazing. And there's the old school movies along the side and you think, this is incredible. The experience was so amazing. But there was a small company that nobody really knew about and nobody really thought it was called Netflix came out. And Netflix started where you would actually have to mail in your movie. You'd say, hey, I want this movie online, and they would mail it to you. But the key with Netflix, it was subscription-based, and there was no late fees. You keep the movie as long as you want. You return it when you had. No problem. But Blockbuster looked at that, and their bias was so set that they said, we, we make a lot of money on our late fees. So we don't necessarily want to give up. If we go to subscription, subscription base online, we're going to lose out on that. So you know what? We've invested way too much in our store. We're going to stick it through. Plus, the internet, really? Dial up. It's so slow. You're not really going to be able to download a movie. What? What kind of world are we living in? Well, a few years later, they missed the boat. Netflix continues to grow. Blockbuster fails. And now... You don't even hear about it anymore. And now Netflix affects us all. And it's in every home, mostly. And we see that. Um, there's a little app that many of us have. It's called the YouVersion Bible app. And uh, the story with that app is incredible. Uh, they actually started with a website because they were so convinced that that was the future that people were going to come to their website and look up stuff and look up information and they were going to do everything they possibly could and they invested tens of thousands of dollars into this website. And after a year, they looked at it and they said, nobody's going to the website, including all of us. Nobody's going to this thing, so what are we doing? But the few of them were like, no, we got to keep doing this. Websites are the way to go. And one person mentioned something. They said, hey... Uh, there's these smartphones that are coming out, and they're coming up with these things called apps. And uh, I don't know much about it, but it seems like that's potentially the wave of the future. And uh, Craig Rochelle, who's the lead pastor there, 
talked about how there was arguments happening where people were so convinced that that's not the way to go. Apps are just going to be a thing that's going to fade away. The website's the way to go that they fought it through. But they, con they convinced themselves and they recognized their bias and said, okay, even though we don't necessarily feel this is the way to go, let's just try it out. What's the harm that can happen? And so they went around and knocked on office doors and they said, do you know what an app is? And most of them said, I have no idea what an app is. But there was a 17-year-old intern. He was doing an internship at the church. And he goes, yeah, I kind of heard about it. How hard can it be? Let's make one. And so he started researching and made an app, the first version of the YouVersion Bible app. And they launched it on a Friday. And Craig Rochelle talks about how they forgot about it. Friday went by, Saturday went by, Sunday went by. Monday morning, they're like, hey, I wonder how that app's doing. So they looked, 80,000 people had downloaded that YouVersion Bible app, one of the first apps um, that came out on the smartphone. Just an incredible uh, amount of downloads. There are currently 300 million active users on the YouVersion Bible app. Why? Because they recognized their bias and said, you know what, our bias is hitting a ceiling. We need to be open to new possibilities, new ideas, new thoughts. Where we're sitting right now, in this building, used to be a peach orchard back in 1964. Where you're sitting potentially was an actual peach tree. And a group of individuals came, and even though it was risky, even though a lot of people discouraged them from actually doing it, they stepped out and they built something amazing. And in the 60s, they built this building that we now get to enjoy and meet together on a regular basis. Because somebody recognized that there was a ceiling that their, their natural mind and the way that they thought was limited to. So they were open to allowing God to open their minds to new possibilities, to new ideas, to continue to grow. And so what's the challenge with this? What's the challenge with having a bias? What's the challenge with having a closed mind? Really? Well, here's what I believe, and here's what I've experienced as well. Imagine for a moment that you right now lived your life based on what you felt was important and you felt was right from when you were 10 years old. Imagine if you lived your life right now based on how you thought as a 10-year-old, maybe as a 15-year-old, maybe as a 20-year-old or a 25-year-old or even a 30-year-old. If you're anything like me, I know that the way I thought when I was 20 is not how I think right now. Circumstances and situations that happened in my life have changed the way I'm thinking. And so if I were to set the bar or the standard for my life based on what my bias was or how I think things should be done, then the challenge is, is that it's going to be consistently changing. Because what's right for me today may not be right for me in a few years from now. The other challenge is that you may be with somebody or married to somebody that thinks differently as well. And so I believe that we need a new standard. We believe something that can be never changing, something that is always consistent. And I have found that in the life of Jesus Christ. I have found that his life and the what he says and how he teaches us and how he lived his life affects us in a way that doesn't change. Affects us in a way where we can always be, God, how can I be open-minded? Not to just anything, but to how... Jesus lived. How did Jesus react to this situation? What did Jesus tell me in this moment? Years ago, do you remember the WWJD bracelets that we used to have? What would Jesus do bracelets? They were, they were around for a long time. Well, I remember uh, seeing that, and I remember thinking to myself, yes, what would Jesus do? But you can actually ask the question, what did Jesus do? It's actually in here. And, and when you read and when you study and when you actually look at what Jesus did for himself and how he treated people, your mind automatically begins to open to new possibilities, to what we feel and to see what, um, how we can be conformed to the pattern of the world, but yet Jesus transforms us. And in Romans 12, chapter 2, I want to read that today. If you have your Bibles or your YouVersion Bible app, uh, don't get paid for that. But um, Romans 12, 2 says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
this idea that we are not to be conformed but to the way that the world or culture thinks, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind through the life of Jesus Christ. How do we renew our minds and get away from maybe how our carnal nature or how our own self wants to think? Because when I'm honest with myself and I think about how my mind thinks, it's selfish. I think selfishly. Well, this is, how, this is how I've always done it and this is how I've always thought. I'm not open to new possibilities. I'm not open to new ideas. It makes me feel good, but it doesn't always necessarily make the others who I'm around feel good. So what does changing our thinking do? What does transforming our mind actually look like? It's simply allowing God to open the possibilities of saying, okay, God, I'm open to seeing what you, how you want to lead me I'm open to seeing what Jesus did and how he operated and how he treated people. I'm open to the idea and the possibilities that maybe I don't know everything. I'm open to the possibilities that maybe I've treated certain people wrongly. I'm open to the possibilities that maybe my mind has been closed off, that I've hit a ceiling. And when we allow the creator of you and I to transform our way of thinking. It impacts us in an incredible way. And so when we look at the life of Jesus, there are examples of what he did and how he treated people that challenge me, challenge my way of thinking. And I want to talk through a few of the things that Jesus did uh, differently. Um, and here they are here. So when we look at the sick, people who were sick in uh, the time of Jesus. Society isolated them, and they were considered outcasts. They pushed them aside, whether they were blind, whether they had leprosy, whether they had issues, whatever it may have been. They were sick, and, and, and society outcast them. Don't stay with them. Stay away from them. Those who had leprosy would have to walk down and, and scream out, unclean, unclean, so people could stay away. If, if people were sick, they would put them on the outskirts of the city so that people can stay, that, uh, people can stay away from them. But yet, what did Jesus do? He touched them. He embraced them. He healed them. And I could, uh, uh, you, you see when you read the scriptures, the gasps that were in the people who thought, <gasps> Jesus, what are you doing? In that moment. But Jesus looked at the individual. He treated the individual as an individual. Didn't do the same thing with one blind man as he did with the other blind man. With one blind man, he felt like he needed to spit in some mud and place the mud on his eyes. And as he washed it away, he was cleansed. To another blind man, he simply just uh, touched his eyes and he was healed. To another, he spoke into that individual. To another, he did this. To another, he did that. Whatever it was, he treated the individual as an individual and met the person where they're at. And then so many times, people would look and thought, you can't do that, Jesus. You can't. You can't touch that person. You can't associate with that person. But yet he did it anyways because um, he simply wanted to reach that person. He felt like he needed to meet that need. And when I, when I read that, I'm challenged because of the way maybe I treat certain people and the way that I may be cautious and being like, oh, I don't know, that my mind goes to, oh, you can't do that. But the question goes back, well, what did Jesus do? Another one here, um, when we talk about the culture, you see, religious leaders were judgmental and motivated by fear. Certain cultural differences, certain things that people were, were uh, doing, choices that they were making, lifestyles that they were living, jobs that they had, occupations. Maybe they were uh, in, engaged in some sort of activity that was, um, that was not right as far as uh, what they felt was right or wrong. And they were judgmental and they were motivated by fear. Well, what did Jesus do? He expressed grace and mercy and at times gasped the religious leaders thinking, how, Jesus, how are you doing that? Do you not know what he's done? Do you not know who he is? Do you not know what job he has, Jesus? Yeah, I do. And that is why today I'm going to eat with him. Because he needs me. Because he needs me. I'm going to speak with this individual because in this moment, she needs to hear the truth of my heart. I'm going to be with this person. I'm going to welcome this person. I'm going to speak life to this person. Because they need me in that moment. And when we see, I'm challenged. Because even in today's culture, there are things that I don't understand. 
when, when I was a young person, there were things in, that, that we did that my parents were like, why are you doing that? I don't understand. And now I'm looking at my kids and I'm looking at the next generation thinking, why are you doing that? Why are... And I stop myself thinking, oh, I sound like my dad. Minus the accent, though. You know, I get, why do you do that? I know. And, uh, and you, you, you think and you're challenged by that. You're challenged by that. And the third thing, yeah, which, which is so close to home, how Jesus treated children. Uh, he viewed the uh, culture, viewed them as unimportant and having little to contribute. They were just kids. But what did Jesus do? Jesus embraced the young and open minds of the children. He not only embraced them, but he used them as an example. Look at what Mark chapter 10, 13 to 16 says. One of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. So you see, picture this for a moment. Here's Jesus doing his thing. There's a whole lineup of people here wanting to get healed, whole lineup of here that wanted to hear Jesus. And here's some children on the side, and, and the parents are like, go, 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 get his autograph, go, go. Or whatever it is. <laughs> I don't know, whatever it's Jesus, it might be worth something on eBay one day. <laughs> and so, uh, so here's the children, and they come, come by, and the disciples doing what they thought was right, what their minds were like, don't bother Jesus, he's too busy right now. They rebuked, and they said, no, do not come here, do not bother Jesus. They were doing what they thought was right, what their minds, with, all, with all, everything inside of them, they thought, no, Jesus, we got this, we got this. These kids aren't going to bug you, okay? Stay back. What does Jesus do? When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the children come to me. And I don't think it was like, let the children come to me. I think it was like, what are you doing? Let them come to me. Get out of here. No, he didn't say that. But he, he was like, no, let them come to me. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these, using children, those who society and culture thought were nothing. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. This story blows my mind away because how many times do I discredit people or discredit scenarios because I think, ah, that's not really important. And yet Jesus shows us right here in, in as clear as day, he embraces children who society thought were nothing. And he embraces them. And not only that, he's, he uses them as an example in what I love about kids and I learn from my own children, their trust and their humility. It's absolutely incredible. And when we think about being open-minded and we think about having an open mind to, to what God wants us to do, those two things are so important in our lives. Making sure you have trust. Uh, for when I first got here, um, I had an, the amazing opportunity to actually run uh, Kidopolis, which is our kids program from one to grade five. And I loved it. I loved how everything about it. And, and I loved how kids were just so trustworthy. I could say anything. And they were like, wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know that story was in the Bible. <laughs> That's amazing. They're just so trustworthy. And uh, we did this one example of a, it's called the trust fall. You ever see it where you're like, all right, everybody fall. And, and so you kind of do one of these and you fall back. And most people are like, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. But there's this one kid who always volunteered for everything. He was amazing. So I called him up and I said, all right, we're going to do this trust fall. And I knew, I knew, I knew that if there was any kid that was going to trust me to catch him, it was this kid because he was so trustworthy, and he, there he is, and he's standing, and I said, okay, are you ready? Here we go, one, two, and before I, I said three, I just went out, see guys, do you really think, and he went, woo, <laughs> and I could hear his head, like, on the pillow that was there, placed on there, this was years ago, it was great, it was awesome, and I remember all the kids were like, oh, ooh. and I'm like, oh, okay, that's, we're going to have to fill out an instant report on that one. And I remember going, I'm like, are you okay, buddy? He's like, that was the best ever. That, I'm like, okay, don't tell your parents that happened, though, okay? It's awesome, man. You're, you're the best, buddy. And uh, incredibly, and, and just an incredible trust that kids have. And uh, when I talk about humility, and I just see the humility in kids' lives where um, most of my conversations with my kids are trying to encourage them that they are great that they, they have a purpose to live by. 
and uh, something happens and they'll come and they're just so humble about um, maybe how, how to learn, especially the things of God where there's, okay, Dad, what does this actually mean? What does this mean? And it challenges my faith. It challenges me thinking, okay, God, how do I want to, what do I want to do with my kids? And I have a choice to say, well, I'm going to instill in them what I know is right and what I know is wrong, which is awesome, but I still need to ask them the question. I need to make sure that your faith and your understanding of who Jesus is is your own. And so at some point in my life, and my son, who's 10 right now, is asking tough questions. At 10 years old, I'm thinking, why are you asking me these questions? It's 8 a.m. Why, just wait. Why are you talking to me about this? Dad, can you explain to me creation? Dad, can you explain to me why some of my friends don't believe in God? Dad, can you explain to me why this is happening? God, Dad, can you explain to me why that's happening? And you know what my parents would say to me? Ah, it's because! <laughs> oh, Dad, thanks, man. That was, oh. My life is transformed. Thanks, Dad, for that. That was, that was awesome. That was really good. And it wasn't their fault. They, they just never, that's how they learned. Back in Italy, they didn't even have a choice to think. It was just like, this is what you're thinking, okay? This is what you're doing with your life. And, uh, but for my kids, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. And so, um, for me, uh, I, I've come to this place where, um, truly, if I want to, if I want an open mind and to experience all that God has for me, um, I need to make sure that I'm open to the idea that maybe the way I've thought or maybe the way I've treated is not right. And I need to allow the life of Jesus to speak to me and the heartbeat of Jesus to speak to me to be able to say, okay, I trust you, God, and I'm going to take a moment of humility here and say that I've been wrong and I need to I need to change the way I treat this individual. And so what do we do with this? How, how, do we actually, um, how do we actually apply this to our lives? And there's three things that I've come with. Uh, first off is recognizing your bias. Recognize that we think a certain way. Recognize that it's not even really something that you're trying to do. Your mind has established certain ways of thinking. And so when a new idea comes and automatically you're thinking, nope, that's not right, take a moment and just ask God. And say, God, um, how do you want me to look at this situation? God, I, I feel this deeply in my heart. I'm passionate about this. But is there the possibility that I'm missing something here? Is there the possibility that my mind needs to be open to a new way of thinking through you, Jesus? Show me, show me what you want me to do. The second thing is uh, connect with people who think differently than you. This one's tough because we like to surround ourselves with people who laugh at our jokes, right? You, you never want to be around people who maybe challenge you and, and, and maybe think differently than you. But when you do, when you, when you actually open yourself up to saying, okay, I'm going to be in this place and uh, I'm going to be surrounded by people, maybe one or two people who, who have never met, maybe think differently than me. I want to see what their opinion is. I want to get to know their story I want to see how they think and how they look at this situation. It's incredible what that does. Uh, I started a, a life group with a friend of mine for young adults between 25 and 35 years old. It's at my house and we just meet together. And that is a challenging group of people. They think weird. They think <laughs> differently. They think uniquely. They think beyond what I've ever thought in my life. But I love it because it allows me to grow. It stretches my mind to think, wow, I'm secured in who I am in Christ. I'm secured in, in, what, I, in what I believe in, but there are certain times where I'm, somebody will say something where I'm like, man, I've never thought about it like that. Why do you think like that? And the moment I ask that question, it opens up a world that I've never discovered because you begin to hear their story and you begin to hear what their childhood was like and you begin to hear what their relationship with their father was like. And you begin to hear this, and you begin to hear that. And you begin to hear the, the tragedies that have happened in their life. And all of a sudden, it's, of course you think like that. 
why would you think like me? I never went through that. And you begin to have a discussion, and it, it's, it's a beautiful thing that happens when you surround yourself with people. Now, we have these incredible groups here at Central that um, I want to encourage you to be able to look into it and say, yeah, you know what, there are these certain groups that I, I should really get involved in to challenge yourself, to maybe think differently. Ultimately, remember to eliminate the ceiling in your life to, the, to, um, to grow to that place where God has created you to be. And the third thing is this. Uh, study the heart of Jesus in his life. I can't express enough how that's revolutionized my life when I actually study, not just read through, but study the life of Jesus. Go through the New Testament and read. Go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see what he did, see what he said, see how he treated people, see what he did here, see what he did there, and let it speak to your heart and let it transform your life because there's nothing else like it. When you capture the heartbeat of Jesus, it revolutionizes your life. It explodes the ceiling off of your limitations and it allows you to grow, to grow immensely in Jesus. When you see it inspires you, it, it encourages you. His life directs you and leads you. It's absolutely incredible. So there's a man by the name of Paul who uh, we know from the New Testament, who had an incredible journey. And um, he wrote the majority of letters to churches in the New Testament. And there's one portion that he wrote to the Roman church and to the Romans um, that has spoken to my heart. And uh, Paul was a man who his number one goal was to simply let people know how amazing the message of Jesus really is. But the places he went to uh, were challenging. The, whenever he'd step into a new city, there were new thoughts, new ideas. And Rome was one of the worst places with the way they thought, the way the culture was. And so what did Paul do? It's, um, it's so eloquently put by uh, a man by the name of Eugene Peterson who translated the original text, and it's called the Message Bible. Uh, it takes the heart of the passage and puts it on paper. And listen to what it says here. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take it, uh, sorry, I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. This encourages me because there are days that are tough. There are days when I experience certain things and meet certain people where it's like, man, you are hard to love. You are hard um, to live life with. But I'm encouraged by Paul because there's this word that he uses there, a servant to all, where he takes his life and says, you know what, God, you've placed me here. I see your life, Jesus, that was a selfless life where you continually put others before yourself. And so that is gonna be my example. And I wanna do the same today. Put others before myself to allow Jesus to explode the ceiling of my life so that I can be uh, created to be all that God has for me. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you um, for the examples that you have placed in your word. I thank you, God, that you challenge us uh, to live a life that is pleasing to you, but yet, God, um, open to how you lived. And Lord, I know that so many times... Um, we think a certain way and we've been, uh, it's just through our, it's ingrained in who we are. And that's not an easy thing to do, but yet God, we see in your word, we see uh, in your heart, the way you did things, God, you did things differently than maybe the way that we think. And so today we pray that you would challenge us. Um, Lord, I thank you for the individuals that are here today. I pray, Lord, that you would be with them this week. That Lord, you would give them opportunities to put into practice what we have learned today. Father, we thank you, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. I bless you today that you would go and be all that you were created to be. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.